understand walking, we really need to understand the gait graphs. The data in these is a pictorial representation of how we walk. Although many clinicians would like to understand walking at an observational level, a full understanding of walking requires appreciation of subtle movements of the joints that are difficult to judge by eye. If you don't believe this, go to an interactive version of Verne and look at the difference between full knee extension and 5 degrees of knee flexion. It's hard enough to distinguish between the two on this model. Imagine how difficult it is to distinguish between them in clinical practice. The gait graphs allow us to be much more specific about what is happening during walking than is possible by observation or looking at the pose of a model like Verne. We start by assuming someone is walking left, right, left, right, left, right, left. We can express time as a line across the screen from left to right. For each stride, there is a period of stance, represented by the thick line here, and swing, as represented by the thinner line. This is one gait cycle. The left gait cycle, in red, starts with one left foot contact and ends with the next left foot contact. The transition between stance and swing occurs at foot off. The events for the gait cycle will be repeated for all subsequent strides and will continue afterwards and will have been started before. To illustrate how the gait graphs are derived, we're going to take knee flexion as an example. This is the angle between the long axis of the femur and that of the tibia. This could be measured with a goniometer strap to the knee as illustrated here, but is more often the output of a more complex gait analysis system. We can plot the angle as it's measured over time as a wavy line. You can see that, to a good approximation, the same features of the line are repeated with each gait cycle. We could use any of these to describe knee movement, but we'll focus on this one. One of the really important things to know about in walking is when stance ends and when swing starts. We represent this by a vertical line, which in normal walking is about 60% of the way through the gait cycle. I next want to think about what is happening on the right side. We can plot a similar timeline showing the different gait cycles, but we'll plot it in blue so we know which leg is which. Think British politics. Left-wing parties were red, right-wing parties were blue. The line has the same division into stance and swing by foot contact and foot off, but these are all out of phase with the events on the left side by about half a gait cycle. It is often important to know when the periods of double support occur, and we can use the timing information from the right side to put a little red tick marks at the top of the left graph at the time of right foot contact. This is referred to as opposite foot off from the perspective of the left gait cycle. We can do the same for the right foot off and refer to this as opposite foot off from the perspective of the left gait cycle. Occasionally these little tick marks are placed at the bottom of the graph rather than the top of the graph. If we've measured the knee angle for the right side we can go through exactly the same process. We can select any of the available gait cycles to plot on the graph. We can mark in foot off. We can use the timing data from the left side to add in opposite foot contact and opposite foot off. One important thing to understand in the gait graphs is how the timing of data from one side relates to that of data from the other side once the graphs have been combined. We've already commented on the fact that the left and right side curves are about half a cycle out of phase with each other. This horizontal line represents a fixed instant in time and we can mark this point on the left curve and the right curve with these two dots. We can then strip away everything apart from the two graphs. These are still offset, reflecting the point that they represent different periods in time. When we combine the graphs, however, this reminder is lost. You'll see that the red and blue points that we know represent exactly the same point in actual time are at very different points on the two graphs. If we want to know what is happening on one side at the same time as a particular feature of data plotted for the other side, then you need to look at a point half a gate cycle away in time, that is, half the width of the gate graph away, either backwards or forwards. This is actually a little bit academic from the point of view of these lectures, which are all assumed perfectly symmetrical walking. If this is the case, then one line will lie exactly under the other, and we will only be able to see the one which is on top. It is extremely useful to compare data from an individual against data from the population, 
and we do this by plotting these grey bands in the background. The area marks the range of data falling within one standard deviation of the mean curve. In other words, the average curve is right in the middle of the grey band. In interpreting the data plotted this way, it's important to recognise that the grey band represents the range in which we'd expect to find 68% of the data from a sample taken from the population with no neuromusculoskeletal impairments. Nearly a third of the data, however, would be expected to fall outside these limits. So it should not surprise us that the blue curve in the graph above falls just outside the grey band for a short period during middle and late single support. It can also be useful to know whether the gait pattern from any individual is repeatable or not. We can do this quite simply by overplotting data from a number of different cycles on the same gait graph. The same data can look quite different if it is plotted in different ways. The same data is plotted in all the graphs on this slide. The curves appear very different because the graphs have different aspect ratios, the ratio of the height to the width of the graph. It is useful if we standardise this so it becomes one less thing we have to worry about when interpreting data. All the gate graphs I ever present have an aspect ratio of 3 units of height to 4 units of width. There is a similar issue with the choice of scaling. Again on this graph the same data has been plotted but the scaling of the vertical axis have been changed. You can see how different the data looks. Unfortunately because different joints move through different ranges of movement it doesn't make a lot of sense to plot all the data on the same scale. I do always standardise this for the same gate variables however. For example I always plot knee data in a range from minus 15 degrees to 75 degrees. It isn't just one joint or plane we are generally interested in. So we actually refer to graph arrays more commonly than to individual graphs. Again, adopting a standardised layout can be really helpful. There is general agreement that the pelvic graph should be plotted across the top, where the pelvis is, with the hip, knee and ankle graphs in descending rows. The columns of graphs represent different planes. There is less consensus between labs in which order these columns are plotted, but again, we always standardise within a lab. In our data, the sagittal plane is always on the left-hand side, the coronal plane in the middle, and the transverse plane on the right. This is not a particular issue in these screencasts, however, in which we will only be looking at the sagittal plane. So, I hope we now have a good understanding of what the graphs represent. In the next screencast, we'll look at the basic mechanisms by which we walk the way we do.